Afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Home Games. It's a lovely October afternoon, and where else would you rather be on a Wednesday than listen to the bizarre clash of finance and whiskey that we're going to bring to you today? It's something a little bit different, and I, I hope very much you're going to enjoy it. I've, I've known our guest for a long, long time, and I've, I don't think I've ever been more excited to do a session. Uh, so say hello to everybody. Julie. Hi. Hi, this is Julie Trevisan Hunter from the Scotch Whiskey Experience in Edinburgh. Um, and there's nobody more knowledgeable, uh, certainly not on this call, uh, about whiskey. So we're going to get into that in just a moment. Um, because of the nature of our subject today, I think we have some people with us that we've never met before. Um, hello, people. Um, so I'll just explain briefly what the format is. And those of you that are old lags, um, you know, um, bear with, bear with. Uh, and I'm sure uh, you'll live through it. Um, so the idea of today is we'll be together for about 45 minutes unless we run out of stuff to say, which I suspect is unlikely. Okay. Um, the chat is open. You're free to ask anything you like. To give this a kind of vague sort of business thing, to be honest, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the dynamics in the whiskey industry and how that relates to some of the dynamics in the financial services industry um, and that's great but much more interestingly if you want um, Julie I think is really open at taking any questions that you have about whiskey um, and she's even got one open in front of her what are we drinking today Julie what's what I am got? trying a new whiskey for the first time um, so I'm treating myself because these are good opportunities to do so yes. so this is a Glen Scotia from Campbelltown um, and it's one uh, that I picked up on my summer holidays this year, obviously, Busman's holiday. Um, it's a super cute little 20 CL, and it's finished in, uh, in Tawny Port casks. Ooh. So it's a special festival bottling. So, um, and nice. it's a really peated version as well. Just, oh. It's just what I fancy this lunchtime. That's how it take good whiskey and ruin it, right? Oh, well, um, I, I like Glen Scotia very much. I've got a 15 year old that I'm, I'm drinking for when I was in Camel Towns a year and a bit ago um, and I'm enjoying that. But that's kind of much less peaty um, and much easier because, you know me, I don't I'm not into the big peaty monsters. You're not the peat monster. No. I'm not a peat monster. I'm not a smokehead, um, though I imagine some people here are. Um, so, yeah, uh, chat is open down the right. Please ask anything you want. If you don't want to use the chat there, um, there's an ask a question button at the bottom of your screen. And if you use that, then I will see the question which will pop up on my screen. And um, we'll make sure to get your questions uh, answered. If you are an advisor firm watching this, uh, I've got something that I would really like to ask of you. Um, you'll see a green button at the bottom of your screen called um, State of the Advisor Nation Survey. This is our biggest research exercise of the year. I'm sure some of you that have you know, listened to me or whatever are sick of hearing about it. The best way to shut me up about it is to take the survey. Um, because we, uh, we we really need to hear from the advisory profession as to what's going on. Thank you to all of you that have so far. Hundreds have, um, but we need lots more hundreds to do it. We're, we're getting towards our target, but we've still got a ways to go. Um, so any of you that can do that, we really, really appreciate it. And um, if you have any audio visual issues at all, I think there's an AV help thing at the bottom. And if you click that, it does actually work most of the time. Uh, we seem to have pretty good connection and audio and stuff today. So um, let's cross fingers that that continues. Uh, there was a, a sort of famous example of it not working, um, which was largely down to me um, about a month ago or so. And uh, I'm still bearing the scars of that so much, actually, that I've, I don't have done one of these for a little while, uh, or certainly not in here. Um, so um, let's start off then. Uh, we've already got some questions coming in. So we may never get to the financial services stuff, which is fine <laughs> as well. Um, but start us off, Julie, talk a little bit about where you work at the Whiskey Experience and how you got into whiskey so everyone gets a sense of um, just you know how, how immersed in the sector you are. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to try and convince you now that I'm um, of my genuine love and, uh, and passion for Scotch whisky. Um, but my colleague said to me, if you've not got a glass of whisky with you, people will think you're just reading it off a sheet. So um, so that's why I have the whisky as well as, as ultimate proof. So, um, yeah, as Mark said, I am I'm here at Scotch Whisky Experience. So we're up next to uh, Edinburgh Castle, so the top of Castle Hill in the beautiful heart of the uh, of the old town. 
We have been here um, as a business since 1988, and I joined um, almost exactly 25 years ago uh, as a tour guide straight out of university and having done a bit of tour guiding overseas, having done languages for my degree and spent a bit of time in Italy, tour guided over there, came back home to Edinburgh and thought, oh, must try and find proper student job, um, having been singularly uh, uninspired by the milk round and uh, ended up here thinking, well, this will be my stop gap. I can use my languages for a little bit and then I will decide uh, what it is that one is supposed to want to do with your life. And realized that I'd found myself in this really unique organization, which is half in the world of tourism and half in the world of Scotch whiskey. And of course, Scotch whiskey and tourism, two of Scotland's very biggest industries. Um, fascinating collaborative industries so both industries whereby everybody um, because of their very nature how they, how they work and are put together work very very closely together um, and I just can't imagine why anybody would want to step out of uh, somewhere where you are in touch with people from all over Scotland um, from a whiskey and a tourism point of view, um, we've got our fingers in all the pies. So we, as an organization, represent almost all of the distillers companies. So our connections on a daily basis are with the amazing, great and the good from uh, all of the whiskey companies. So we connect with them, we work with all of the, the master blenders and the whiskey makers, um, the, the big and the small, uh, the, the new and the very, very oldest, um, the really well-loved, incredibly well-known, famous brands and the absolute hidden gems and just a bit of, of everything. And I could never imagine moving into an area where you only talked about one really small aspect of it. So one of the things that I absolutely love is that whatever conversation we're going to have, and one of my favourite things is trying to find synergies with a very oblique uh, topic, but finance has actually not been that hard. Um, because there's connections in the world of whiskey as in stories and themes and contents that, that link with absolutely everything, especially when you have that whole whole world to talk about. So my career has gone from being um, a tour guide when I first started 25 years ago through just about every different department in the business, um, doing a bit of retail uh, in our whiskey bar when we first set that up, our private events, our whiskey tastings, our training school, and, and finally moving into the marketing of, of all of that. So um, so now I'm a uh, marketing director here. And, um, and that's been my journey. One of my most proud achievements, which I brought along with me today, um, is uh, a blend that my colleague and I created uh, a number of years ago now, uh, 12 years ago, which is our 21-year-old blend um, for the Scotch whisky experience, which was an unexpected pleasure because we went through to um, the, the blender, to the master blender that was going to create it and thought that there would be maybe a, a range of four, six, eight different samples made up as blends and we would pick the blend that we preferred. But there were hundreds of samples of single malt and grain whiskey, all of at least 21 years old, laid out, ready for us just to create a blend. Um, so I was absolutely terrified of my capacity of being able to do that, but as hopefully Mark will attest, um, we created a, a beautiful, beautiful blended Scotch whiskey. So um, that, although it's a number of years ago now, absolutely still sits as one of my, um, my massive highlights in the, in the whiskey world. It's very, very tasty, and you can't buy it anymore. You were saying that there's only no, two bottles none, none left, left with you. I've got a bottle. You have but, to be um... invited for dinner at my house. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, there's quite a lot of people on the call, so it really does amazing <laughs> dinners as well. But um, I, I think that might be that might be pushing it. And judging by some of the names that I know down there, you don't want them around your house for dinner. If I'm very honest, yeah. uh, there'll be some reprobates in there. So let, let's um, let's try and do something serious, and then I'm going to pick up a couple of the um, there are a couple of sort of whiskey-ish questions. One from Tom that's, um, that works with us, but you're still allowed to ask questions, Tom. Um, so this is a uh, ours is an industry with lots and lots and lots of very small businesses working alongside and sometimes in concert with and sometimes in opposition to very, very large businesses. And it strikes me that anybody that's been to any of the smaller distilleries, if you've ever done the tour or whatever, um, that must be true of 
the whiskey industry as well. So is that a, does that create tension? Is it a, a kind of healthy sector in the dynamics of how it runs or or do we get clashes along the way? Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating. It's an extraordinary um, moving feast. And um, if I uh, may go back in history uh, a wee while, there was this kind of point in history where the whole whiskey industry changed from being tiny, small farmhouse operators, uh, mostly produced by women. Um, the women were doing the, the brewing and the distilling and it was all cottage industry and it was a lot of, uh, of excess barley from the, the harvest and obviously it wouldn't necessarily store for so long and it, it's this tiny farm cottage industry. Um, and there is a literally just one point in time in, um, in 1823 when the government decides they're really not doing terribly well at collecting revenues and excise, and they're going to rescape the whole industry and the whole landscape of, of what distillation looks like. And they bring in the, the Excise Act. And at that point, you suddenly start seeing these big distilleries because there's a sort of blueprint written for how, how you have to distill Scotch whiskey. You must have a minimum size of a copper pot still. So that's one of the key things that obviously changes the scale of how whiskey is made. And the only reason for that is because, you know, the smaller the still, the easier it is to hide it and not pay your taxes. So they reduce all the taxes significantly. Um, so they make it much more, much easier to, to be able to pay them. But they say this has to be done in a way in which you can't sort of secrete it any longer and, and you know, hide in your hills and glens. So you start moving into these bigger companies. And like if you visit distilleries and you've got the established above the, the gate on the door, you'll see that all the really old distilleries come into being in the 1820s, 1830s. Um, and frequently they say this is the first legal date of distillation of this distillery because of course it was going on beforehand but the scale of moving it up making it big and taking the license out for the distillery tend to happen so sort of in the 1820s and the 1830s after that happened so that's when you start getting these big companies and um, then you get blending and blending happens to sort of the tail end of the 1800s and when you start making blends then that's when volume becomes huge absolutely huge and that's when obviously as a result you um move down to the central bell and you get um blenders and bottlers and merchants in in the cities and they are driving the industry they're driving the consumption they then get big and they start buying distilleries and they buy one and then they buy two and then they buy more and that's kind of the way that the, the whiskey industry was then built up into having um the biggest distiller, Diageo, which was originally um, Distillers Company Limited and then became United Distillers and then became Diageo, the biggest. But you've got um, Chivas, which is another huge one. Um, and, you know, plenty of other really big ones. But they all came, their history is all from those days of, uh, of blending and acquiring distilleries so that you had a continuity of supply and you had control over the quality of what you were getting to put into your blends. So that's kind of the history of where all that came from and why it's ended up with some really big uh, companies. In the time that I have been in, in whiskey in the last 25 years, the landscape's changed massively. Uh, so when I first started, it was quite a, a smaller number of quite big distillers companies. But with them, um, you know, with the recession in the 1980s, they began shedding some of their sort of non-core essential um, distilleries, mothballing them, keeping them in very good work and order, but not producing any longer. And after a certain number of years, obviously took the decision that actually, you know, if somebody made an offer and was interested in purchasing the distillery, they, they were up for selling it, which would never have happened before. So then through the 90s, you start getting um, either other drinks companies buying a distillery and having a scotch brand as well um, or just different people coming into the market and, um, and buying up these distilleries and then you sort of roll forward another 10 years and very very slowly you start seeing new distilleries being built and this was a, a um, distilleries had really some of them had been built in the 50s and 60s and then there'd been nothing um, and then in the last 10 years, you've started seeing a lot of new distilleries being built, some by the, the huge distillers, but most of them as small craft distilleries, boutique, you know, whatever you want to call them, um, or just small individual venture capitalists. So 
the way the whiskey industry has always worked has been has been to do with blending. 90 odd percent of our sales are blends. They're not single malts. And in this way, the large and the small have to collaborate together to sell stock or to even barter stock because there's still a lot of stuff where money doesn't change hands. Um, mm -hmm. Even in the biggest distillers, they have agreements of kind of what the value of this distillery would be in 10 casks there compared to five casks here. And, and it's just exchanged that way. So that collaboration is, is kind of forced because of the nature of creating blended Scotch whiskey. So um, there most definitely are, um, you know, competitive elements to especially some of the bigger ones. But when you get down to a production level, and you travel around and you visit the distilleries and you speak to the people, there's just no competition at all. Really? That's everyone collaborates, everyone helps. People will literally pop down the road to, you know, take an eye on a piece of equipment that they know about in a competitor distillery because everything's still very, very local and still very much part of the community. And still they have this generational thing of, family members that worked in those distilleries and worked with them before. So the collaboration at a production level is almost unbelievable, given the ownership of some of the brands that you are um, you're looking at. You, you almost wouldn't believe it. It sounds I mean, it sounds kind of idyllic, right? But if you if you are in a relatively small distillery or you own one or, or whatever or you or you work there for a long time and you get picked up by Diageo or Chivas or LVMH or or whoever it might be these these big big well I mean something like LVMH isn't just a drinks brand is it it's everything Absolutely. it's just luxury goods yeah. mm -hmm. um in our sector right we've got thousands and thousands of relatively small advisory firms who are doing a brilliant job for their clients and it is kind of like that I, I don't know if they would collaborate in that way. They certainly might share stories over a beer or best practice or something. I doubt if one of them said, oh, I've got a problem with this investment that somebody from a opposing firm would pop around and help them out with it. Um, they might, you know, laugh at them and swear at them or something, but I, th I don't think they would help. But they certainly, you know, in the interest of driving the profession forward, because it's, it, you know, it's trying to position itself with some success as, as a profession like solicitor, accountant, or, or, or whatever. But there is this move of private equity funded deals coming in and hoovering up a lot of these firms into major organizations. And some of them are household names like St. James's Place and others, others are, are a bit less so at the moment. Now, the hard thing in that is there's a lot of thou shalt about it. We're heavily regulated too. And I think that that point that the regulation drove the growth of the industry. I think most people on here would say it's the other way around for, for us, but I'd be interested to see in the chat what anybody thinks. Um, the, the sort of thou shalt of you've now joined this large advice brand, therefore thou shalt do it this way. You'll give advice on these products or uh, use these tools and technologies or whatever, is something that I think a lot of firms struggle with so to make their peace with anyway and often they're a bit unhappy even if they've made some money joining the bigger organization that that kind of directive element to it really gets in the way is that not the case in your sector do people get to do what they were doing before i, th I think i mean it, it won't be the same in every single organization and you, you're absolutely right there's there's real synergies with them um, with with the way that some of the you know big external venture capitalists have come in have, have kind of looked at the the long-term opportunities that are with Scotch whiskey, the real kudos that there is behind behind certain brands, the potential for global sales that they have. Um, a lot of distilleries were blending distilleries, so you never saw them as a single malt. So then there's a massive opportunity there to let that shine, to put um to put capital into it and to put brand behind it and to say you know this distillery's always been there you couldn't even buy it as a single mole and um, somebody maybe got the odd cask and did an independent bottling but you never saw it and some of the real success stories have been um of bringing those things to the fore so when you look at it in that perspective which is what's often happened uh there's there's so much opportunity and love being shown on um on a new brand that uh that things then don't change that much um and people have so much more opportunity around around where it's going to go and the investment in things as, as well you know obviously helps massively the the distilleries i've been to certainly 
a, a lot of the ones that have had big investors come in and, and you know international so not places that are you know headquartered in the UK so it's not even they've got this lovely sense of Scottishness or you know the or, or UK company that, that are looking after them it's just foreign money um mostly they have all said they're completely hands off right because what they have bought this is massive inherent risk in changing anything okay yeah, you're yeah. really only going to know what the effect of that is in 8 10 12 years time at which point you don't want to go actually <laughs> um so so generally changes on that kind of you know production level i think are very much driven by what the what the production team on site would would want and would like and um, investment that they've they've always hankered after but haven't had, and I don't think imposing changes uh, at that level is is something that tends to happen. Right. Um, it's very much kind of let let you do as you're as you're doing, and and the production teams very much stay the same. They're not kind of floating in big guns from from elsewhere to take over. So it's it's almost always just seen as opportunity um, and it won't be the case 100% of the time obviously that would be um, an idyll that I'm sure doesn't exist anywhere but but generally speaking it's a pretty hands-off approach that this has been going on for in excess of 500 years you know what you're doing you know we bought into the knowledge of you doing the right thing and knowing what you're doing and we can we can help um, expand that production increase the numbers um, and do things and do things well um, but generally, it's, it's received incredibly well. Brilliant. Um, I've got a couple of things I want to ask you about that long-termism thing. You get a, you get a wee drink there, um, and I'll get, come to a couple of the questions in the chat. Andy, hi, Andy, how you doing? Uh, ask is it a new whiskey Jenga game sitting behind you there. That's a great idea, actually. <laughs> That's this a product man, that's shortly going to be shipping, isn't it? was on a, a whiskey documentary which was made a number of years ago and then they decided because they'd made it and we'd worked with the production company on some of the stuff and they decided they were going to sell it off for charity um uh, david Heyman, the actor was the uh, main presenter in the series and he has a couple of charities that he he works with and he said if we can sell that map off it's been made and um, we'll just do it as a sort of silent auction and and we thought well, it'd be a nice thing to have here so although the re rewiring and drilling of the LEDs every time the new facility opens up, you know, is a bit of a poison chalice. But uh, yeah. but yes, yes, I wouldn't fancy taking it apart. But whiskey Jenga, brilliant. Whiskey Jenga, right there down uh, for Christmas. What's not to like? Uh, sounds Jenga. brilliant. Um, yeah, Thomas, is it okay to talk about Welsh and Japanese whiskey? So where do we stand on? Um, interloper. I saw one from the Cotswolds the other day, and that can't be right. Yes. Tom, yes. I should mention, lives very close to Wales, if not in Wales, uh, and obviously has a. a I, I love. Um, yeah, I, I love an "is it okay" question. They're my favourites. Um, so <laughs> one of the things that uh, that we are very much um, behind here is getting rid of all the, the myths, the stereotypes, the "this is how you must" and "this is how you mustn't" and, and all that kind of thing, and just trying to open whiskey up and make it as accessible to people as possible. I have poured myself a dram of single malt, but um, you will happily see me with an old fashioned in my hand as well and always a drink in scotch. Um, Japanese, so obviously the most traditional kinds of whiskey are Irish and scotch. Um, they're the, the oldest, um, most long-standing whiskies. Japanese is fascinating because it came into existence sort of in around about the 1920s um, and it is a carbon copy of scotch. Right. Um, so uh, there was this uh, fascinating character um, who came over from Japan, studied in Glasgow, did a bit of organic chemistry, studied around the distilleries, went back to Japan and said, right, let's try and emulate Scotch. Let's set up distilleries in areas of Japan that are similar climatically as much as we can to Scotland and we'll follow the process identically. So um, Scotch whiskey, another one I wanted to get into this, Mark, is spelled without the E. Um, Irish whiskey has an E. Um, then the American whiskey followed the Irish spelling, so it has the E as well. Japanese, because it wanted to emulate Scotch in everything, um, is spelt the same way with no E. So different whiskies, different parts of the world have an E or don't have an E, but often it's depending on where they took their inspiration from and if they want to make themselves closer to Irish or closer to Scotch. So Japanese whiskey, um, incredibly good whiskey. 
we um, have a, a fabulous event here once a year, which is the International Spirits Challenge, where master blenders from all over the world come and judge all whiskies, all global whiskies, um, here in this venue. And we have two of the, the Japanese um, master blenders that come over from Nika and from Suntory. Um, so I've had the pleasure of meeting them over the years. Every spring they come over and we meet them and we get to know some of their new whiskies. And they are extraordinary. They're exceptional. Um, really, really high quality. But whiskey has been produced everywhere now. You know, Australia, Tasmania, New Zealand, uh, India have a huge amount of whiskey. Um, uh, obviously, Canada, the US. So so it's it's really, really global. But Scotch is quite unique in terms of the fact it's very heavily regulated so scotch is more heavily regulated than any other whiskey um it gives the distillers really strict parameters in which they can experiment so um you know having a a, a tawny wine cask finish is to some extent about as far as they can go um the, the wood is regulated, the production process, the ingredients, the length of time it's matured, all these things are, are very, very fixed from a quality point of view, um, which keeps Scotch, you know, up where, where it needs to be. So other countries have a slightly more sort of lazy, fair, open, experimental approach to how, how their whiskey is produced. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I mean, it opens up more innovation and experimentation, um, but also, you know, negatively, opens up room for the quality not not to be where where we would want it to be in terms of scotch whiskey so um so yeah i'm very open to global whiskies but my heart is absolutely always always with scotch brilliant well you, you aren't going to be able to do the session without t taking at least a few can you recommend questions so let's take one from matthew I haven't, this is a pretty common story isn't it i had a very heavy night on whiskey 20 years ago and blah 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 for me it was when i was 17 and vodka in prague um and i've never drunk vodka since then um so but if matthew wants to re-enter the market he'd want something that was fairly light tasting where should he start fab so um i think that the best thing to do for me to get into whiskey or to get in more into whiskey from wherever you're at um, is to compare and contrast because it's incredibly difficult to nose this whiskey now today here at this moment in isolation and then next week try something different and in any way try and work out which one you preferred. Um, so our absolutely most popular tour is the tour where you get to taste five really small samples of each of the five different Scotch whisky producing regions. And in that way, because you're moving back and forward, you get a real idea of what your own palate is and what flavors and characteristics you prefer, because if everybody is, is different. Um, getting into whisky, I would generally say to steer clear of anything too heavily peated or too heavily sherry, just because they're really challenging in the palate and they're very characterful and they've got a big palate and a long finish and all that kind of thing. That being said, I've done tutored tastings with corporate groups where you have one of each and people say, I never liked whiskey before and I love Lagavulin 16 now. It's, it's because it's nothing like what they thought whiskey yeah. was because they maybe tried a very, very light blended whiskey, you know, which was their cheaper option in the student drinks cabinet or the family drinks cabinet when they'd run out of beer and it was already two in the morning and and their perception of what whiskey is is so sort of full, yeah. far away from <clears throat> them, something that has those characteristics so the best thing to do is um is to do that kind of thing and go even just go to a bar um there just has to be two of you and two whiskies, two empty glasses, and then you have half a measure each just to compare them and see and see which one is kind of more up your street. Generally speaking, though, you know, a, a lighter whiskey, but not too light, because the lighter the flavor of the whiskey, the more you just pick up the alcohol, right? So, um, so not incredibly light. I would go in for a single malt, um, go for an old fashioned. I mean, that for me, it's like a proper cocktail. Mm, but uh, but you really taste the whiskey in it. So you get the whiskey coming through. You can pick a single malt and you can you can pick up that individual single malt in it. But it's not um, 
is obviously not as overwhelming as just you know a, a straight measure. Also, adding water is absolutely crucial. Um, Mark, you're a big agreeer of adding water and adding wow. like, these kind of things. Um, some people entirely disagree and, and don't and don't like water at all. But if you find it in the slightest bit sharp at the back of your palate, then it is within your power to get rid of that sharpness immediately with a little bit of this. Um, remember, one of the fundamental ingredients that goes into Scotch whiskey is water. It's one of the three ingredients. It's not like it's an odd thing to put into it. Most whiskies will be watered down to bottling strength of 40, 43% before, before you buy them. Um, so adding another little bit is, is really just what is going on all the way through the whiskey making process. Um, so smoothing out those edges, you get a much creamier um, characteristic in the palate usually when you add the water. It opens up a lot of the aromas um, and it'll certainly smooth it. But just adding it incrementally, like a little bit at a time, um, uh, never thinking you just need to knock back a straight measure. That's probably not the, the best entry into getting back into whiskey again. You mentioned the sort of five, well, not the sort of, but the five regions. I, I mean... Some people, I think, like the whiskey here and will know exactly what those are. But for um, Matthew, what are the regions and, and where's a kind of more challenging or less challenging place to start? Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's really interesting because the five Scotch whiskey producing regions are only Scotch whiskey producing regions. They don't correlate with any other slicing and dicing of Scotland, either in the, in the present or historically. So a line is drawn. It kind of follows the Highland Fault line. So it's a geological line where the... The countryside differs between the highlands and the lowlands. Can you draw and it on the Jenga map? So, so they go from. Can you reach it? Yeah, can I reach the Jenga map? It goes across the bottom here from the um, from the Firth of Clyde at Glasgow to the Firth of Tay at Dundee, and anything south of that is the lowland region. Um, then our lovely sort of section up here, which is close to uh, close to Inverness, so in between Aberdeen and Inverness. That's Speyside, and Speyside is named after the River Spey, so the sort of fastest flowing river in Scotland. And those distilleries all sit around the tributaries and the source water that comes up in the hills and glens up in Speyside. Uh, the rest of the mainland, including most of the islands, is known as the Highland region. So um, any of the, of the mainland distilleries, be they in the mountains or on the coast, be they up in the Orkneys or over in Skye or on Mull, they're all Highland single malts. And the only island um, that has an exception is the island of Isla itself. So Isla, um, our, in our Wild West way over here, is, uh, is an island and is a region in its own right because it has such a unique characteristic with that peaty phenolic thing. And the final, final region is way down on the um, Mull of Kintyre Peninsula, almost at the end of it there, um, which is the, the Campbelltown region, which again, Campbelltown's interesting because up until Prohibition, it had 37 distilleries. They argue about exactly how many there were. Obviously, they weren't all terribly official. Um, but and, and they now only have three. So um, a really small area in terms of the number of distilleries, but a huge history and a very, very particular characteristic. So, so that's, the, that's the five regions. And you can make generalizations, but you know, obviously every distillery will, um, will have its unique you know, factors and characteristics in them. Brilliant. Right, let's do a bit of businessy stuff again, and then we've got some other questions which we'll come back to. So I'm interested in kind of the long-term game in whiskey because it's very similar to what advisors do for uh, their clients. They're setting in motion financial plans, which may not pay off for 20, 30, 40 years, depending on what it is you're trying to do. And, and for um, many planners, so advisors um, kind of has a meaning and financial planning is a different reason. That can easily last till your death and well beyond your death if you're talking about the transition of assets. So these guys can be building plans that could last for 50 or 60 years. So we'll, we'll outlive them. Uh, and that's a hell of a thing. And it means that they have to take a long-term view in their businesses as well. I'm guessing whiskey is one of the very few industries where you make a product and you don't know if people will like it for maybe 10 or 15 years down the line. How, how do these businesses cope with that? Yeah, it's it's fascinating. In fact, I was um, corresponding with um, with one of the distillers this week who um, have existed with Douglas Lane uh, Distillers, and they've existed for a long time as a bottler. Um, 
50, I'm going to get it wrong, 50 years at least. Um, and they now have two new distilleries, an absolutely tiny craft boutique, tiniest distillery I've ever seen called Strathairn up in Perthshire. And they're building the mighty new Clutha distillery on the Clyde, obviously. Um, which is a, going to be a big distillery. It's a nearly eleven million pound um, project, and uh, and and the final line of our correspondence, as we chatted back and forward about a few things, was uh, from from the owner of the company was, but you know, whiskey's a long game, um, and I thought, yeah, it, it just absolutely is, and um, there there is there is nothing you can do beyond knowing that you're producing whiskey today, and you're not. It is unable to be sold as whiskey legally for three years. So once it hits three years, um, it can be called Scotch whiskey. It's not even called Scotch whiskey until it hits three years. It's just spirit. Um, so you can you can do what you want with spirit, but um, it's quite expensive to produce single malt Scotch whiskey. So not really any point messing about with it and doing something different and not being able to call it single malt Scotch whiskey. Uh, it's not going to mature in three years to the point that any of us would be, you know, sitting, sipping like this. So there's loads of experimentation going on in terms of using smaller casks to, to speed up maturation um, and, and looking at, you know, distillation to bring out different flavours and things. But ultimately, the, no matter what you do, you are like 8, 10, 12 years before you're going to be able to really get in return from a single malt point of view. Um, an interesting thing in terms of the new small crafty boutique type distilleries is that you see them setting up very much as tourism and hospitality businesses equally as they are a Scotch whiskey distiller so that they're going to be able to have some income coming in from that, especially the ones you've seen um, round about uh, Fife, uh, Eden Mill, which is being rebuilt just now, um, Lindores, Kings Barnes, all up round about St Andrews there's an opportunity there for lots of hospitality for all the golf, all that kind of thing to see them through until they're actually making money out of whiskey. But the other big thing, of course, is um, we, we, we have to mention it. And um, can we talk about it is the rise of Scottish gin. Um, now, gin is a way of having a brand from your distillery, usually not using your single mole, usually using a pretty neutral spirit that might have come from a green whiskey distillery. And, um, and creating a gin brand, which you can just then sell tomorrow. You know, gin doesn't yeah. need to sit there for any length of time at all. So this huge um, burgeoning industry of Scottish gins, you can see goes hand in hand with all the new distillery builds. Um, so until they're able to get the, the, the end game is getting the single malt out there, but um, but alongside that, if they can build a gin brand um, and, uh, and and get that revenue in that sees them through. But it's interesting because the passion is behind the single mold. All right. these other things are seeing them through until they get to the point of having this brand of single mold that, that, can, that can launch and go out there. But you're beginning to see less fixation on ages, um, on it being eight, 10 or 12 years old. Um, there's whiskies coming out now that are kind of eagerly awaited that are maybe only six or seven years old. Mm -hmm. And they've done brilliant, brilliant work on maturation. And they are, they're great. You know, they're really good. Um, they're not a 15 year old, they're not a 20 year old, but you know, they're, they're really solid single malts that they've managed to take to market that little bit earlier than, than you would think. And a year makes a big difference. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Um, and if we're talking long term, then uh, the audience here will immediately turn around to investments. And Abby and Josie basically be asking the same thing. What about whiskey as an investment? So there's, I was I had one of those spammy Twitter ads popped up at me the other day about a bottle exchange thing where they were acting as a broker for people yeah. who didn't have big parcels to sell. And I know that uh, probably at least some of the people on the call will collect whiskey with a view of maybe uh, it maturing in value as an investment. What do you think about it as an asset class? So there's, well, there's two things um, and they're they're both pretty contentious because the market has exploded in the last five years, but, you know, really ramped up in the last two. And, you know, all these headlines in the papers like, you know, more, you know, worth more than gold and doing better returns than, than everything. Um, but there are some pretty unscrupulous intermediaries uh, that have been coming into the market as well. Uh, so, so there's been a bit of a, a polemic around around that. So there's two things. There's investing in casks. 
um, which is the the one you need to be much better informed about because obviously when you purchase a cask it's still under bond so you have all the duty and VAT implication and the warehousing and the annual fees and also a cask is not necessarily going to mature in the way that you planned it to so you need to know you've got an extraordinary distiller that's keeping an eye on these casks and doing what they need to with them to make sure that the, the, the whiskey in that individual cask is maturing in the way that that you would want it to um the other side of it is purchasing um bottles so um yes yeah, so this one it's not available any longer so presumably it goes up in value um that's kind of really brand specific in terms of what does incredibly well um and very kind of built on kudos of big well-known brands um so you know the macallan tends to be the one that that sells you know ridiculous crazy prices a few bowmores have done incredibly well when you're talking you know really silly amounts of money in auction um people that obviously put collections together so mm. you know a lagavulin collector not big collector tends to be the stuff that's the big powerful um single malts that that have done individual vintage bottlings over the years um that that really appreciate and value like that a lot of the the blends you know you could get a bottle of blend from the 1950s 1960s that you'd be like wow like a real piece of history because it's not doing anything in the bottle it's just you know inert once it's in the glass it's not maturing it's not getting any better and because those blends don't have that incredible kudos behind them they're not appreciating in that same way so it, you you really have to pick and choose with uh with with what's uh what you're looking at in terms of the single malts so in your kind of bottle store and that's a terrible way of seeing the very lovely shop in the whiskey experience but you've got some insane bottles in there i mean it was huge absolutely bottles. yeah yeah i mean i think i think and i could be wrong i think our most expensive at the moment is thirty thousand. um but you've got whiskies that are like, you know, 50 years old. And when you get 2% evaporation from the cask every year, uh, just by virtue of the fact there's not very much left in it when you come yeah. to bottle it. Um, and, you know, these spirits are are extraordinary. Um, I, you, these are ones that are absolutely unique that will definitely go up in value. But also the vintages as well, you know, bottles that are, you know, produced in this year, distilled in this year, bottled in that year, particular cask finishes, um, limited edition runs, that kind of thing. All these things that you can pick up round about 100 to 200, 300, 400 pounds, they all have their unique place and are unrepeatable. And some of them will, you know, ultimately be ones that were like, that was the one, you know? Yeah. So if you buy enough of them, one of them will be one of the ones that really <laughs> well, that's, I think somebody asked about the risk profile of this, and I think that's it. It's diversification, isn't it? But you've got to yeah, be absolutely. able to buy enough of it to, to, to really make that work. Last, I mean, we're, we're coming up on our time, and I can't believe it already. I just want, quickly want to touch on one more dynamic that's got some kind of read across to our sector, and that's about people. Because um, I never understood till you told me that there is an individual or a very small group of individuals that make sure that, let's say, a Highland Park 12-year-old taste from five years ago tastes like a highland park 12 year olds this year and they don't add flavorings or chemicals or anything to it so there are these master blenders that are making that work and i'm guessing is that the kind of peak of the industry when you when you work in whiskey is that kind of what you aspire aspire to become i yeah i think it's interesting because the industry is so diverse but from the, the people that end up as master blenders are often organic chemists and so sometimes they've come in through the route of food technician and organic chemistry and, and kind of just gone that journey over the decades in the company. Um, sometimes with the smaller companies, there are people that have taken different routes into it that have been less um, less technical and, um, and less scientific. Uh, historically, it was all, you know, just handed down. I'd love to say mother to daughter, but probably a bit more father to son. Um, and it was all experience based, but irrespective of how scientific these things get, um, there's a huge part of it which is just about nosing. So they'll run all the mass spectrometers and everything that you could possibly want to get the sort of DNA and the fingerprint and all that kind of thing. But ultimately, once a month, everybody gets together, they sit down, they round a table and they nose. And they look for the key markers exactly as you say it's about continuity and consistency and one of the interesting things that people don't realize is the single malts are all created and made consistent by the master blenders 
Um, and it's not just about creating the blends, the you know the, the huge ones that we're all familiar with, the sort of Dewars, the Shivas, the uh, Johnny Walkers, the Valentines, all those. Um, it's also about creating um, the, the Lagavulin and the Balveni and the Highland Park and making that consistent flavour and characteristic because every single cask will be different. And you mm. have this enormous stock portfolio to, to manage and make sure that they're all going in that right direction. And so to get people through that, I mean, it's a, it's a very long-term career choice, I guess, that you're making. And one of the, the issues a lot of planning businesses have is getting people who are happy to learn their craft over quite a long time and maybe the rewards don't come as much for a while and it's heavily regulated you need exams and you need, you need all that kind of stuff as well is there a ready supply of people who want to get in on the ground floor in whiskey and, and kind of work their yeah. way through to that yeah there, there really is it's, it's such a kind of desirable industry to be in um, and sort of connected and affiliated with uh, you know with with these amazing brands and there's such a history and legacy. I mean, we, we're really fortunate because we're here in the middle of Edinburgh and we're very close to Heriot Watt University who run a brewing and distilling course. And the number of people that end up in that brewing and distilling course because of family legacy from all over Scotland. So you'll have people who come from the you'll, where, where the lights are on the map, um, the areas that the distilleries are located and that have this family history in it and that, you know, are not batting again saying oh well you know my grandfather was a doctor and father was a doctor and i'm going to be a doctor and you know that that love of the industry and, and getting into it and um, really sort of runs runs deep i think and there's you know and there's a few people i know that um i've spoken to recently actually last week i was speaking to two different people that are distillery managers who were both in pharmaceuticals that was their career for 10 or 15 years where they went just done with it this is a fascinating career choice and they've moved into um into production and, and they're both now distillery managers um and and we're I, I, effusive about about that change in career and how happy they were now in the so i think there is always a, a ready supply and amazing apprenticeship schemes as well that are that are run by all yeah. the big distillers and some of the small that's interesting, and our, our sector is nowhere near as good as it should be at that kind of stuff, so we should learn something there. Right, listen, we are at time. I'm going to fire two quick-fire ones at you, right, and then we better stop. I'll let people about their day and you about yours particularly. Um, Lee, who's a, a, I know Lee is a, a big uh, a big whiskey aficionado, asked about silent distilleries, and if you've got some stuff from them, is it drink it or keep it? Yeah, so, I mean, there's not so many silent distilleries as there used to be because they a lot of them are reopening. So um, Diageo have a couple that they're reopening or rebuilding at Port Ellen and at Brora, um, which were kind of famous silent stills and silent distilleries, and you could only get the old bottlings and there was none left and all that kind of thing. But there's such a big boom that, you know, a lot of them are reopening. So um, so not, not so many around now, which is great. <laughs> Yes. Um, and Steve, who I can almost see from here, he's a, he's a tight-fisted fifer, as he says. Is there a sweet spot in terms of price? So you've got cheapy blends from, from the supermarkets or whatever, and then obviously super expensive. Is there is there an optimum kind of price value point, do you think, for, for drinkers? So this is whiskey? just personal. This is purely personal. So off the record on YouTube, um, I... This is what I do. So I love whiskies from a palate point of view, and I only buy whiskey to drink. I don't collect it. Um, from a palate point of view, I love whiskey from 15, 16 up to 21. But the best whiskies I've ever tried have all been around 17, 18 years old. And for me, the sort of price point of between 80 and 120, 130 um, is usually where I, I'm happy to spend my money, more than happy to spend my money in terms of value of the liquid. So we're talking about buying it because you want to drink it. Yeah. Um, so the quality of the liquid um, that is in the bottle for the price you're paying for it, I think when you sit around about these points. But the one thing I would say is, we need to all stop worrying too much about age statements because there are some really small limited edition one cask only um that might not even have an age statement on it but it's it's been put in some really interesting casks to finish and such like and um 
and you're getting something that maybe costs 70, 80 pounds, it might not be as old as that sweet point of age that I've said, but you get some phenomenal stuff around about that price. That so sound that, you that heard. That sound you heard was Steve falling off his chair because I think he was hoping you'd say 25 pounds or something yeah, like that. Yeah, 25 is fantastic. <laughs> and there's one very, very final question for me, and, and obviously people go if you need to go, but we've just had an Aldi open outside the office, right? And there's single malts in there that I've never heard of, absolutely never heard of. And so when you see these kind of things, Aldi and Little being, being kind of really obvious ones, where it's distilleries, are they actually distilleries or is it just, just a marketing name they've made up? What are they selling and is it any good? Yeah, no, they're not. They're not. They're not distilleries. You won't find them on the map. Um, so you've got things like um, Ben Bracken, I think, is a Little or an Aldi one. Uh, what they'll do, and Tesco will do the same, you know, it's like Tesco's Highland Mall, Tesco's Speyside, and sometimes they'll give them a made up name. Um, and it is just, it's a distillery which produces mainly for blending um, and which is not pushing hard at their own single malt portfolio usually and is more than happy just to bottle uh, for one of those supermarkets. So it is a pre existing proper absolutely um legitimate single malt scotch whiskey uh masquerading under something different and usually with uh, with enough googling around or enough looking at the small print on the bottle of actually who the bottler was because they always have to say it um you'll probably be able to hazard quite a good guess at, at which distillery it came from brilliant well listen thank you so much for coming to do this There's exactly nothing in you for, uh, in this for you so thank you very much what i will say is if you're in edinburgh and you're looking to go for a nice dinner somewhere there's a restaurant in the scotch whiskey experience called amber which is absolutely brilliant and this walk well there's a room isn't there of whiskey that yes. you can walk into there's a whiskey collection um and it's a, a remarkable experience go do that uh thanks everyone for joining thanks again julie um and all the best to everyone we'll see you next week blank out see thank you later you.